Yes. We're on a search for one of the greatest powers ever known. The Sword Airgites, legendarily powerful, was sealed away and could only be opened with the Airgite Stone. This stone was made a prize for a fighting tournament, and whoever won would take the sword. Wait, what's that? Oh, we're talking about the Discovery episode Araga? Whoopsie! Bless you. We're on a search for one of the greatest powers ever known. Last time the brain destroyed an entire city. Discovery becomes embroiled in a Hands diplomatic off. crisis with a menacing foe. On the next exciting episode of... I have an idea. Star Trek Discovery. Welcome, friends. We're back talking Star Trek Discovery Season 5, Episode 7, somehow getting dangerously close to the end of this season, series, whatever you want to call it. This one is entitled Araga. Now, there will be spoilers ahead. If those are not for you, take this as your last warning. Let's crack on with the show. Well, last episode definitely felt like a bit of a breather between the main storylines going on here. This one just kicked right back into gear and went full force towards that overarching storyline. Sure, last episode we went and picked up another piece of the puzzle, but we still have not really gone to that next meeting place yet. So we are definitely on the last leg of this mission to figure out this progenitor tech. A lot happened in this episode. A bit of it felt a little bit disjointed to me, but I have to say the one thing that I've been wishing for asking for, hoping for, the entirety of this season since before I even knew it was coming out. Well, I knew it was coming out before I even knew what they were going to do with this season is the return of... That's right, Nan is back. She had a pretty decent role in this episode, but I have to say, I was left feeling a little bit... um flat with her appearance. Not that what she did wasn't important and vital and she didn't use her characteristics and her strengths as a security officer, but we didn't spend any real time with her getting to know what she's actually been up to since we last saw her, and I know it didn't really serve the plot, and that's something that probably had they overdone it would have dragged and weighed this whole thing down, but if this is the last time we're actually going to see her, fingers crossed she pops up in a couple more episodes before the end, it won't necessarily be that grand send-off I was kind of hoping for, considering she is kind of an underutilized character. She jumped to the future with the rest of our crew and then kind of went off to do her own thing, so it would be kind of nice to follow up with her and just see how she's acclimating into this new era and all of that stuff. All of that aside, most of this story came down to the old tensions with the Breen and Locke and Maul. Everyone's kind of uh, converged in the same place. We go to Fed HQ, as they keep calling it. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I really don't like the fact that all these people are calling it Fed HQ. That's a little too cutesy for me. Kind of similar to how everyone in all of these futuristic shows are now referring to things as tech. I think that's probably having to do with Stark Tech and Avengers. Everyone just kind of took that as a shorthand. These are the little things that get under my skin, but it's not anything to write home about. All of this was taking place on Discovery and near Federation headquarters because the Breen were coming to us. They wanted to negotiate for the return of the prisoner. No, they did not want to negotiate. They explicitly didn't want to negotiate. They just expected us to turn over Locke and, by extension, Maul to them because of the Araga and all these diplomatic things, whatever. They don't do diplomacy. I think it goes a long way to showing that they believe they're sort of maybe a half step above all other organic life forms, kind of looking down upon them, kind of similar to how I assumed that's why they joined forces with the founders in the Dominion War, because they look at themselves more like that higher echelon being than they look at us as just these, uh, solid monoforms. We got to see Dr. Colbert trying to save Locke's life, although there wasn't much medical work going on. That's one thing I kind of miss from these more modernized Star Trek shows because we aren't doing the episodic thing all that much. We don't get to see a dedicated episode of them actually utilizing their medical skills for the most part. There's just one or two hand wavy things. They mention something and then we move on. So we didn't get much of a chance to see Colbert actually being a doctor. What we did get to see is him throwing hands in a fight, so that's always nice to see. And we got to see this impressive jacket keeping the cold away from him, and I want one. 
Not gonna lie, most Starfleet Star Trek jackets are the things I want. I want a Wrath of Khan era jacket. I want the uh, the away team jacket from the first episode of Enterprise. And now I want Culber's jacket from when he's in a very cold sick bay. Which leads me to the Breen refrigeration suit. Apparently they captured one, they were keeping it in storage. I would have really, really loved for them to actually show it and utilize it in this episode. I think it was a missed opportunity to drag out a DS9 era Breen suit, although I know there was lots of things going around at the time like, oh, they just stole that from Star Wars, so maybe they're trying to move away from that iteration of it. I can live with it, I just, again, feel like that was what they were setting up for, and then we never actually got to see it. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Couple other things going on in this episode. We learn that Locke is actually the direct link for lineage in this society of Breen, meaning that his uncle can't actually succeed to the throne without utilizing Locke. And I guess some of the other Breen higher ups are trying to capture him as well in order for them to finally get a new leader. They've been in some form of a territorial civil war trying to figure out the next leader of the Breen for a while, which also leads nicely into Captain Rayner. Sorry, Commander Rainer's backstory, where we learned that Teleron was used as a Breen outpost for a number of years. I'm just thinking of it in terms of the Cardassian occupation of Bajor because that's a nice um, shorthand, I guess, to actually seeing what happened here. Kind of nice to get that backstory, especially in this episode where he reverted a little bit to his more uh, out-of-line ways. I guess it was founded, so to get both of these things in the same episode kind of counteracted them and left him in a neutral state. Turns out that the piece of whatever they found last episode is a metal library card, which has some sort of subspace telepathic link to the place that the actual artifact is hidden. What if Dr. Derricks created a transitive link between this card and the place it came from. And, and because of this link, this empathic link, Book is able to activate his, whatever you call it, read the signal or the signature that was left as an imprint on the card, which is some sort of way to see across the galaxy to wherever this artifact is actually being stored. Seems a little bit like magic, but we'll let it slide because... It's not the most magical thing we've ever seen in Star Trek. It just slightly defied the laws of uh, believability, at least in my opinion. So that's where we're going. It turns out that they're going to some giant floating library, which houses all sorts of stuff. Kind of what I thought was going to happen when we saw that trailer at the beginning of the season. It's like the seed vault that uh, Nan went off to protect earlier, except this is protecting knowledge, books, anything and everything that we don't want destroyed if some grand cataclysm happens so there is a repository of our knowledge out there somewhere. One piece of follow-up I feel like they absolutely needed is they proved in this episode that the Breen ship that destroyed Federation HQ in that alternate timeline a couple episodes ago is this same Breen ship, which now lets us know that it wasn't actually the progenitor's weapon which destroyed Federation HQ, it was this encounter. Had Discovery been removed from the timeline via that Krenum time bug, they would have not been here, and this Breen Federation encounter would have inevitably led to the destruction of both Federation HQ and the Breen ship, so it had absolutely nothing to do with the utilization of the progenitor weapon, which gives me a little bit more good feeling because I thought it was kind of wimpy to show that all it did was destroy some technology. So kudos for them to show us that this was just part of of the puzzle pieces leading up to them finding this progenitor weapon. So theoretically, we would have to assume that this encounter went the same way, but without Michael Burnham and friends there to kind of uh, come up with a plan, it went to hell and the Breen ended up getting in a fight over Locke and everyone was exploded. Probably meaning that Locke was never stabbed in the first place, which kind of is... How did they find... Whatever. I'm thinking too much about this alternate timeline, and I'm almost talking myself out of liking the one thing I did really like. Reno was utilized quite well in this episode, but again, she's just sprinkled so sparingly throughout these episodes that I thought this was going to be the big episode where we follow her for the entirety of the main storyline. But again, she was just kind of utilized as a way to get from point A to C. She was the B in the middle of there. Boy, I really hate the way I described that, but I'm going to leave that in. Uh... 
I may have padded my resume with that one. And then, of course, we get to the end of the episode. Throughout this whole episode, Locke not doing too well. He OD'd on some of the drugs that were trying to take his pain away in an effort to allow Maul to escape. She did escape. However, it was too much. He died. She came back to his side just before he passed. And, uh, well... Now she's going off with the Breen because they're married. They're this uh, coupled pair. She's going to give them the progenitor tech. And it appears... Dr. Velik believed that since the technology could be used to create life, it might also be used to revive the dead. So she thinks by doing so, she'll be able to bring Locke back to life, which could hopefully really tie into this Culber subplot that's not really going anywhere yet about spirituality, the soul, the dead. Because if this can, in essence, actually reverse death, bring somebody back to life, you're going to have to go and explain what happened to their soul, their spirit, their being in the meantime. And whether or not we get a fulfilling explanation on all of that, I am hopeful. But also... How is a TV show really going to wrap up life and death in a meaningful way? Fingers crossed they give us something really good or at least something really intriguing to chew on and think about. And it could have ramifications going forward. So I am kind of excited to see where they go with that. It could fall on its face. It could be a crying Kelpian who blew up the universe. Or it could be a very satisfying end to a pretty decent season. Overall, I definitely thought this episode was a step up from last episode, but thinking back on it, I do think last episode will fare much better as a just individualistic rewatch than part of a serialized storyline from beginning to end of the season. What are your thoughts? Where do you think we're going? Are you excited to find out what's going on with the progenitors? Do you think Locke is dead for the long term? I can't imagine he is. Leave whatever you think down below, like, share, subscribe, do all those fancy YouTube things. And until next time... 